Yeah. Yeah. Hello, yeah. sir. Hi, hi. How are you, Ikene? How's it going? I'm good, Moses. Uh, Daniel, how are you? Not bad at all. Fantastic. Wow. Good to good to meet you. Yes, yeah, same here. Same here. Same here. So tell me, what uh, what side of UK do you live in? I live in uh, Bromley. I live in Kent, Bromley. Oh, okay. 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 What about you? Where do you live? I'm um, just in uh, not uh, outside London. What Watford? Watford. Oh, not that mm -hmm. bad. Not that mm -hmm. bad at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Great, 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 great to connect. Uh, great work yeah. you're doing. I read a few, I read a little stuff on your social media. Great work mm. you're doing. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been looking at uh, listening to you, watching your videos, you know, and uh, I think uh, it's good for us us to talk, you know. I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It, it is, it is because uh, we need to do more, don't we? Oh yes, you know. Oh yes, we need to do more. When you look at all the struggles, and um, it's like I said, to you, I was saying to the other someone the other time. I said I wish I knew a few Nigerians who were millionaires when I came to this country. <laughs> well, you know. Well, well, okay. Yeah. I wish I knew. I wish I. I wish I had them as friends. I wish I knew what they knew. I See, wish I saw them to inspire me when I came in 19, 20 years ago. I wish okay. I knew them. Okay. You know. Well, so I, when I when I first. When I first came to this country, I knew a few. Uh, wow, you're, you're, the, you're one of the well, lucky I, ones. I, see, listen, listen, I knew a few, but uh, the mentality I had yeah. wasn't uh, geared to learn from them. Okay? I, have, I, I had a different mentality than the one I have not to, today. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, I missed a few opportunities. Yeah, to learn from them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anyway, see, uh, Daniel. See, I would like you to introduce yourself to my audience and tell them what you do. Great, thank you so much, Ekene, uh, for having me on your podcast. I'm so super humbled to have been invited to this great interview. Uh, my name is Dr. Daniel Moses. I am a property entrepreneur, a property consultant, coach, mentor, um, also help others to invest in property and help others to create property portfolio using our mentors uh, and processes that we have used over the last six years we've been in the property industry um, to scale and grow their portfolio. So I'm also a keynote speaker, Amazon bestseller, and also a podcaster just like yourself. Yes. Uh, I own the podcast called The Wealth and Business uh, Podcast, yeah. uh, which is a podcast where we share people's journeys and stories, especially the journey of the ordinary becoming extraordinary. So yeah, that's just me. And yeah, I'm happy to be here. Okay. Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So like you just said, uh, you are so many different things, okay? You are an, an entrepreneur, a bestseller, an, an author, uh, public speaker, podcaster, millionaire mentor, everything, okay? So I want you to just take some time, tell us your journey, okay? Because I know you didn't start from here, okay? Like we, or, we have already talked earlier, Yes. You didn't start as you are, okay? Yes. Now, your journey will be very vital to me and my audience. Tell us your journey. How did you get here? Oh, thank you so much. Um, I, I always love that part when people ask me about my journey. Yes. Because um, one of the things is always when people look at success in yep. general, people look at success and a lot of people focus and see more of the glory rather than the actual way it started from. So I was born and raised in Nigeria in a small city called Edo State. Um, my father, uh, you know, and my mother, um, you know, where they raised me as a very, you know, responsible child. At least I've never gotten into any sort of dangerous, too dangerous okay. trouble. Okay, yes, like, like myself. Of, <laughs> I've been naughty once in a while in my life. But yeah, so that's just me. I'm a... 
I'm the 26th born of my late father. I wow. have 30 children. My mother is the second wife of uh, about approximately seven wives. Although he had more concubines, but seven wives. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what is raised, you know, being yeah. raised, in, raised in Africa. Polygamy is 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 is, is normal yeah. in that particular generation. In yeah. fact, you know, and that was the kind of family I came from. So, um, you know, going through primary school to secondary school to university, I went to University of Benin. And during the last year of my of my study, studying anthropology, sociology and anthropology, I, uh, I wanted to kind of escape out of Nigeria due to the pressure, you know, due to the challenges that I was basically facing at the time in my life in, in the university. Now, the, one of the challenges was I was, you know, once upon a time, you know, in my second year or so, you know, I became quite famous in school, became quite popular because I sold clothes, cars, you know, my elder brothers lived in Japan, you know, at that time. So they bring all these different types of things into Nigeria. I would sell them. So I became quite popular, quite known. So, Interpreneur. Yes. So I was quite <laughs> very bubbly and I, I became friends with friends and other friends and other friends. Yeah. And I remember, you know, before you know what's happening, you feel like you needed to be protected. Mm. You know, you needed to be protected. You needed to be, become a member of a particular groups and stuff like that. So at some point for me, I just felt like, okay, so became a member of a group and in the end, it wasn't really what I really envisaged it would be. And I got fed up of it. And I just said, you know what? I can't put myself whereby I could be killed. I can't, my mother already lost one child mm. already. All right. And, you know, before I was born, you know, my mother had already lost one child already before I was born. And I said, I wasn't prepared to be killed. I wasn't prepared for her to go through that the second time. So I had yeah. to find my way out of Nigeria. Yeah. So I found my way out of Nigeria. I wanted to go to America. I didn't get a visa. I wanted to go to Canada. I didn't get a visa. I wanted to go to UK. The UK never let me in. At some point, they, they finally let me in. And I, and I came to the UK. So coming to the UK, no brother, no sister, no, fam no really close family relative, you know, and I went through that phase of my life whereby coming into this country, you know how it is, you know, when you don't know anybody, it's not easy. Yeah. Slept through the floors, did all types of linear jobs, trying to settle, you know, and that took me through the very first two years, uh, around about just uh, almost two years of my journey, mm. then meeting my wife the following years. I met my wife, you know, in, in October, you know, around about October, 2006. Uh, probably around about October 2005 or so, I met yeah. my wife. Meeting my wife here, who was a non-Nigerian, she was born, bred in Uganda. No, she was born, you know, in, you know, in Uganda, but she came here very young, really, really young. So she's more born here, to be honest. Yeah. So I met my wife. The, cult you know, the culture. Uh, yeah, exactly. Met my wife here. She's not Nigerian. You know, she's from Uganda. She's British. She is in this country. You know, we met. We fell in love. And falling in love then leads to more reason why actually, you know, I thought, okay, yeah, I'm seeing the greener light now. Got a, you got a great relationship. So we kind of fostered our relationship quick, very quickly. Um, a couple of months later, we got married and, you know, we got married. We decided to raise a family. And um, raising the family, you know, we got married, you know, had two children, two beautiful children, Abraham and Angel. My first is 14 years old now. My second wow. is 12 you know, so we, we started to raise family together. At, at that time, I did all sort of businesses, security guards, you know, you know, back, uh, like I said, linear <laughs> job. you name it, I've done it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and to be honest, the, the life I ran away from way back in Africa was, you know, you know, the insecurity, rather not to be killed, but to come to this country and to live a better life. Well, in 2012, that better life that I thought I would get, you know, and all the other money or, or you know, all the good things, yeah, it wasn't really forthcoming. So actually, I was frustrated after frustration after frustration. And I, at that point, I decided to relocate back to Nigeria. Mm. Relocated back to Nigeria because now I've got friends there. I've got my mom there. I've got my brothers there. I've got literally my immediate family there. Even though my wife is here, I still miss them. But I went, always went back home. Always went back home. At every given point, I always went back home. So 
I went back to Nigeria. I went to start an oil and gas business, so which was moving petroleum products from point A to point B to point C. Yeah, you know, to to petrol stations, you know, and would take the petroleum product, give it to the petrol station. Sometimes they will sell it to pay you back. Yeah. Then, which allows you to make more profit. I've, I've done that too. <laughs> great. Fantastic. You know where I'm coming from, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, I did that and very quickly, I was making good money. I was making, you know, over seven, eight Naira per product. You know, it's really, really good, lucrative. You know, the business started to grow. I was managing it, had, you know, multiple drivers working for me until this very fateful time in 2015, where two of my trailers loading products, loaded products with, you know, 65,000 liters tanker, you know, two of them ran into each other around Lokoja area in Nigeria mm. and literally fell into the valley and burst into flame. And literally, I was so lucky that nobody died. My drivers mm. escaped. Ah. And, you know, it's quite a very emotional story, but I'm not going to go into it because every time I go into the story, it brings tears to my eyes. So I'm going to avoid it. <laughs> wow. So, and that was just that. So I, I lost over 150,000 pounds equivalently you know, and when I lost that money, to me, one thing just struck me, you know, it, it, was it that I was chasing shadows? Was it that I was, what is it that I'm chasing that I wanted to become? What is it that I, I'm looking for that I wanted to become? I've literally done so many things in a short space of time in my life from, you know, you know, you know, migrating from, two, you know, 2004 to this country to going through that phase of my life, challenges after challenges, nothing is ever working. The only thing that got, I got left with was entrepreneurship wasn't for me. I'm useless. Wow. And the only thing that came into my head that it's done, it's finished. And I remember coming back to London in 2015, you know, you know, 2015 and through that 2016 and just, you know, being depressed, completely depressed in my life, going through anxiety, going through all through all manners of things. And just now wondering, okay, I've tested a bit of wealth. I've tested a bit of money. I've tested a bit of success. What else can I do now? I remember my wife asking me, what next? And I look back in my wife and said to her, I don't know. I think it's done. I'm useless now. I'm, 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 I maybe just go and, you know, just maybe go back to those linear jobs I've always done. To behold, the only thing I could do, because I've never really had a proper job or a proper corporate life, the only thing I could do was delivery driver. From delivery driver, I got a job as an Uber driver, got my license, and that was the only thing I, I was able to do. I, and I just went through that phase of my life. So I think I'll leave you that for now. If you've got any more questions around that, then we'll wow. move on. Wow. Uh, see, Daniel, I love your story. <laughs> see, I see. I, I love your story because is it's a story that many many Nigerians, Africans in this country and back home we can relate to. Many, yes. Okay, and. Uh, I want you to continue, okay? Because you. you have told this story about how hard things were for you, okay? Now, I want you to push forward and tell us from there to now how you got here. Because I, I, can, I, can, I can already see the new next step okay i don't know how you got into it but it's very very important for young people to realize that it doesn't really matter where you're coming from yeah but with vision and getting the right people around you and importantly for them to actually step back look at those people and decide who 
they need to listen to. Because I see from your story, I will tell you, I don't know your story, okay? But like, I will tell you, without you listening to certain people, you won't be here. True. Okay, so, so please tell us that story. Fantastic, thank you so much for that. Yes, you're very right, you know. So I, I got I, I, at that point where I started as an Uber driver because I wasn't employable or I never really had a proper job and stuff like that. For me, I think this is where it's important to understand one thing storms and mm. seasons not every storm that blows and blows so heavy where there is no hope has come to destroy okay storms where you go through life do come to blow you to catapult you to the next level okay so for me when i went through you know, that journey. So first, as I mentioned, all the different things that happened at different phases of my life, plus yeah. what got me into the UK and what got me, you know, into going back to Africa and establishing my business in Nigeria, obviously it got failed, you know, within literally within less than three years or three years where that business failed. And I, at this point in time, looking at my wife, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do. You can imagine you're married to a woman who is in a corporate industry. She has a corporate job. She has a corporate life. You know, you, I'm looking back to her and it's like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And, and say, so are you just going to sit there and do nothing? I said, I don't know. From a man who would, as an African man in Nigeria, I never, my father didn't raise me where my, my, my mother paid for food or paid for rent or paid for water mm. i was the sole responsible for whatever we did in my family so from mortgages to water i pay everything looking back in my wife and say i don't know you can imagine how devastating she felt at that particular point and and i'm like i don't know what we're going to it, it felt like it was almost like I, we were going to die that's how it felt like it felt like we're going to die there is no hope because i couldn't see any hope. And I remember asking her, I said, what are we going to do? She said, I don't know. I, can't, I don't see no light in this tunnel. I don't know how we're going to get her, but you need to do something. So got myself a job as an Uber driver eventually because I was doing delivery job. But one thing happened, I think I've never really shared this before. When I became a delivery driver, I would go pick up my kids from school. My kids would join me in the car. I would deliver those parcels there in the car. Sometimes my son and my daughter, they're helping me look for what's the next number, mm. you know? Oh, daddy, that's number four. That's where we're going. That's number three. It became fun. And we'll come down from the car together and they will actually knock on the door. You know, it, 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 it started to build a new me where I really started to see that love, that fatherhood with them. All right. This, you know, I started to really bond with them because before then I was always traveling back yeah. home. Mm -hmm. and stuff so i started to really bond with them now for me i started to that alone started to be like it was almost like a therapy for me to forgetting that i've just lost the business i've lost everything back home and i was going through that loneliness and i remember this day i was having a friend i was having a chat with a friend who was, his name is kevin cool and he's an he's a taxi driver and he said how much are you really making uh, you know as a taxi driver i said well so as a delivery driver i said i make about two three hundred pound a week he says that oh you can make that in a day you know but you have to drive go and get a taxi driver license and that was what got me into uber and when i go into uber all right i uh, would drive at least 18 hours wow. a day this was 2016 2017 full time minimum 18 hours a day Man. now the thing about me is that i'm an extremist whatever i do i'm extreme you know if my wife will crown give me a crown she will definitely give me a crown that i'm an overworker you know and those that are around me will tell me that i overwork a lot because i've come to realize that success come to those who work hard hmm. so at the time i was driving my uber i'm working i'm working so hard just to make hand meet because i had already created a lifestyle for myself because i did have a business that grew to 150,000 pounds you know i you know I, it was quite substantial business it was great business it was good business and not being able to just settle for less 
I'm driving over 18 hours. Sometimes I have my reflections. Ah, is this, I will speak to myself as like, Daniel. I'll speak in my local dialect to myself. Oh, Daniel, now you be this. <laughs> man, now you be this. What's it happen? I question myself. I went into depression, serious depression. I was, for two years, I couldn't sleep. For two years, I couldn't be at peace with myself. Series of divorce attempts with my wife. I was placed on the highest of amitriptyline, uh, antidepressant dose. And, but one thing was working, God, I'll pray, you know, read my Bible. I'll pray, you know, you know, not the holiest of holies, but just pray. I'll pray. I'll go to church on a Sunday, go to weeks, you know, once, a, once every while, every now and then I'll go to my weekly services. And I remember this day I was dropping someone off in Stansted airport. I was driving to London and I, I felt drowsy while I was driving and Ooh. I wanted to sleep. You know, and I pulled, I found the next service station and I pulled over into the next service station. And I decided to take a nap. It was in that nap, I got a revolution to go into property investment. Mm. And I, I've never looked back. So I went into that sleep. I woke up and I got the revolution that this was what I needed to do. Coincidentally, I picked up my phone after waking up from that sleep and I was going to pick up my next ride as an Uber driver to bring me into London. Something told me to, you know, to just open my Facebook account. I opened up my Facebook account and whilst I was scrolling through, something pops up in my face, how to get into property with little or no money. You don't have to have experience. You don't have to have lots of money. Just get started anyway. I looked at it, like, you know, click on the link if you want to know more. I clicked on the link. It's a link telling me, oh, to know more, I needed to pay 70 pounds. <laughs> and it was the only 70 pounds to be honest it was the only money i had in my account that needs to buy me petrol that would take me all through to friday because uber pays us every friday i paid 70 pounds anyways on my credit card it was the last balance i had i said okay no problem let me buy this now because i may not see the link again i didn't i wasn't techie savvy so i didn't know i could search it again i put my credit card details get registered on it begin the day. I remember on the weekend going to the event and I was in this room. It was like I was in a mirage. I was somewhere where there's so much confusion. Every single word they're speaking by the, by the guy made no sense. In fact, I was the only black. I was not just the only black. I was the only Nigerian man in that room. Everybody else was Asian, was white. I was the only black man. First of all, I had this awkwardness, not seeing any Nigerian person, not seeing any black person in the room. I felt very awkward. You know, I, you know how it can be. I'm intimidated. I've been in this country till 2016. I've never really mingled with people mm. outside Niger. I've never really mingled around, you know, other ethnicity, apart from the corner shop guy who owned the off license in my road that knows me. Yeah. I've never really had any other kind of friends like that. But my wife does because my wife was born and raised here. So I've never personally made a friendship. And I'm in this room. The guys asking me, you knew, I was like, guy, I'm new, but I don't know what you guys are talking about. Everything made no sense. They're talking about BRR, buy, refurbish, refinance. They're talking about rent to rent to HMO, self accommodation. They're talking about property investing, how you can borrow properties from people and how you can repurpose that property. Nothing made sense. Anyway, cut long story short, I, with a leap of faith, the guy finished presenting. I said, he's inviting us for a three days seminar, you know, in a different location. Now you have to pay again. I'm like, ha, ah, okay, no problem. I'm going to do it. I raise up my hand. I make a little commitment. Then I then put in a you know, process to pay later. Then I go to church on Sunday. I'm picking up my friend from church and like dropping him off at home before going for my Uber drive on the Sunday. And I'm talking to him. Oh, I've just been to this event, you know, in central London. Ah, I'm going to go and do property. I'm, I'll soon quit Uber. Bro, man, this time next year, I'm not going to be driving a bike. And the guy looked at me and said, guy, that's the way they talk so. You want to dig your grave? Now, scam. It doesn't work. I'm like, so this is me having a very high spirit. You know, I'm boosted up. I'm so fired up now because I've spent, I've made some commitment. Hundred pound was a lot of money. So I've spent 70 pounds. I've made another extra commitment for the three day seminar. The guy's inviting, inviting me for. And I'm like, this guy just told me he's a scam. Have I been scammed? But anyway, with the leaf of 
faith, I find my way around it, worked even more during that couple of weeks, raised the balance money, paid the guy, went to the three days event. The first thing he said on the first time for a couple of hours in the networking event, and the second thing they're saying now in this room, some things I'm trying to make more sense now. And I'm like, what next? I've got the information now. Let me go and do it. But he said, oh, I need a little bit of a help. If you do need to have access and you want to come back to me every now and then, let me mentor you. Imagine I went to University of Benin. I read sociology and anthropology. To be honest, I only thought mentorship was maybe from your dad or your mom. That's it. I've never really understood correctly what mentorship was. Mm. And this guy is now asking me to pay to mentor. I'm like, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> And in my mind, I'm like, okay, I see where this my Nigerian guy was talking to me yeah, about this scam. It's a scam, yeah. And that was it. And I was like, okay, regardless, anyway, I'd rather be scammed of the next amount than to remain a, a taxi driver because at that time, it's like something has now stirred up in my spirit that now tells me this is the way. But at that time, it still did not make sense that it was God leading me somewhere. It wasn't, I wasn't aware where the mission would be, whatever will happen. But cut long story short, I took the leap of faith again. I started working with this guy very quickly. By the end of 2016, I learned, 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 learned. 2017, I then put the relationship, the information and the connection I have built. I found properties according to exactly how I've been taught. I found somebody else. I explained everything to them. In a tinkle of an eye, by 24 hours later, somebody paid me 1,700 pounds. I'd be 1,900 pounds. I can't remember how much it was, but just less than 2,000 pounds. I was like, for real, my eyes almost came out of my eyes. I said, so this thing works. This thing works. I just made almost 2,000 pounds just like that. If I drove 18 hours as a noble driver, and I just did something less than two, three, four hours, and I made 2,000 pounds, oh my goodness. I said to myself, I'm going to either, this is it. This is it. Mm. And I kept learning. I kept learning. So cut long story short, I took myself into endless, I took myself into endless coaching, into endless mentorship programs, working with different mentors. And cut long story short, by the end of 2018, I resigned as an Uber driver I had created a business worth over 80,000 pounds in gross revenue in my first year. It was just absolutely amazing. And, wow. and, and, that, and, and, and that is the beginning of greater things in my life, you know, and I think I'll pack it there again. And maybe you might have some questions. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. See, uh, this is something that's, uh, many of us do not understand and just like your friend uh we we don't understand things and because we don't understand them we tend to label them as scams okay now i'm not saying that there are no scams in those areas but I know even though there are scams, there are still a lot of these businesses that opportunities are there are real opportunities and there are businesses that produce value to the business owner, to the customers, and pay taxes to the government you know i i used to well not used to i i know a person he's a, he's a, he's a very good for, friend of mine today who when i first met him uh, the the information i got from people who knew him who knew him as friends but they don't they didn't they didn't know anything about his, about his business uh, they, they basically told me what it does is a scam. Okay. But having been with him for the last uh, eight years in his office, uh, the tax 
authorities come there to do their investigations and they go away and he has ne never been charged for anything uh, about scamming. Yeah. So I know, I know his businesses are legitimate, even though people don't understand what he, what he does, but he does real business. You see, most of us are not, are not business people. Now, I'll, I'll use one, one person, uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, I'm not a I'm not a, a big fan of his as a as a as a politician as a, politi a, as, as a politi politician. Uh, yes, even his businesses has some some dodgy edge of his business, but basically his his property business are legitimate, even though they are not uh, acceptable to some of us who have never been in business okay so and then, but then again then again this is the issue right sometimes you find people who judge what they don't know yeah right that's, what, that's what i'm who, just saying yeah you see people who judge what they don't know and you see how for example the the the, the one thing people don't understand business is not created out of a structure it's created out of opportunity and creativity mm. You don't become a multi-millionaire or a billionaire through hard work. You become a multi-billionaire through creativity. Now, your first millions need hard work, right? Okay. Your next million needs network. Your last part is creativity. Mm. You know, you don't move from the bottom to the top without first working hard. So I am in a working hard stage of my business because I'm trying to hit 10 million. Okay. Once we get to 10 million, the rest of the business is not going to be built on hard work is going to be built on creativity, the team, the people I have around me. The next part is who do I know who can introduce me or who can make an introduction? Okay. Relationship. Okay. And that's how success comes. And that's exactly what happens. So for example, I can build so big today, right? In my local borough as a property developer, and I have great relationship with the council. And I'm also, you know, I live in the council. I live here. I work here. My business is here. And I got what it takes to develop a certain type of property. Now, let me give you an example. The fact is that if I lobby correctly, the council will always put me first because they know what I'm, I'm able to do, the investment I've brought, the development I've brought to the society than to honor somebody else. And that was exactly what someone like um, you know, Trump, Donald Trump okay. has done in his business. So I just thought I'd quickly, because I'm his fan. Yeah, yeah. That's why I, I mean, quickly... see, <laughs> see uh, uh, maybe... Around uh, 2016, uh, I attended uh, a property seminar uh, that is associated with uh, Mr. Trump, okay? And Mr. Uh, what's his name now? Rich Dad Poor Dad. Uh, Kosaki. Kosaki, yes. He, they had, they had a, a seminar, which I attended. I paid over 500 pounds to attend. A, a three day seminar. So I know what, what, what you're talking about because I, I've been there. Okay. Yes. Now I'm not a property developer because even though it made a lot of sense to me, it wasn't something I wanted to do. Yes. So I, 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 I understand it, but I haven't, I've never done it. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now what, what, uh, area of property investment are you into the uh are you, is it commercial or uh residential residential Which yes one i'm in the you? residential industry okay so what kind of uh, uh properties do you provide to people in your community so, yes, um, I, you know, the UK, you know, statistics have shown us over the last, you know, 1,000 years that the, 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 the property market is, is always a great way to build wealth, build stability and yeah. create an income. So, uh, for me, statistics has also shown that the UK need over at least 150 affordable homes being built. No, 1,000, 150,000. 
exactly 150,000 sorry yes 150,000 being built on yeah. a yearly basis apologies there slip of tongue <laughs> and for me i deliver luxury hmos houses okay. of multiple occupations yeah okay all right uh, to 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 occupants people who are looking for affordable homes so for example people who are looking to rent a decent room so I'm sure those of your listeners who might be listening now, who probably when they came here, the first thing they ever rented was a room. Yeah. Right. And when you rented those rooms, you know, five people sharing one kitchen, you know, five people sharing one bathroom. So what we've done is to bring a, lot, a little bit of a luxury spin to it, mm. whereby we're renting out rooms, all right, to them, but they now have a shower in there. Ah, okay. They have a, some of the rooms have kitchens in them, all right, as well. So those are the kind of rooms that we're that, beginning that's to good. Market. That's a good, that's it's a good, uh, absolutely and which is more affordable so and it's all bills inclusive so you pay us one rent so to rent a one bedroom flat in london if you're a single person you're looking about at least one three hundred to rent just the yep. one bedroom flat yeah by the time you pay your water your gas your council tax and all of that your total cost you're looking at, at least a thousand eight hundred pounds to two thousand pounds a month right so our market is dealing with people who are looking to actually pay the one three together all bills inclusive so they don't have to pay nothing else mm, mm, mm. right and so that's the kind of hmos that we provide which is called co-living spaces yeah interested interested so in the next 10 to 20 years what countries would you offer the best value for real estate investment in Africa. Okay. Now I'm going to Africa. I know, I know you are not, uh, your business is not based on, in, in Africa, but I'm sure I'm as, African. A, as, as an African, uh, I'm sure as somebody who has done a little business in Africa and now in the property area, you would have been looking at what is going to happen in the property business in africa we have we have the the largest amount of youths who are in the next 10 10 to 20 years will be buying property will be renting property so what area of africa will have the best value for investors like you in africa and why Great question. I think there, you know, the first thing first is that at the moment, the African market, there's a lot of money to be made across Africa. I think, first of all, Africa needs to create an enabling environment to lend money, you know, to lend money. I think there needs to be a, a whole reorientation mm. of how we see money, first of all. So we need to, there needs to be a whole reorientation of how we see money, how we use money. Yeah. You know, we have this mentality in Africa is money is meant to be made and meant to be enjoyed yeah. immediately. So we, make money <laughs> and we enjoy it. And that's why you go to weddings and you go to parties and you see all spraying money and all of this yeah. nonsense, right? You see, all, you see, it, it's become a culture whereby if you don't spray money in Africa, it's almost like you're a bad person, but actually you can give an <laughs> to someone to actually contribute and the money will get to them to be honest rather than you spoiling it so i think the whole reorientation of african wealth needs to be positioned that's number one yeah number two i'm originally born and bred from you know from nigeria you know Af nigeria has great great potential now statistics have shown us that nigeria could possibly be one of the largest economy over the next you know 100 years yeah nigeria could be part of the largest economy that's what statistics have said lagos being one of the most visited nation all right so i actually read this article the other day uh, uh um from from uh, from this day it's quite a while i read it from these day papers and where there's that there was that prediction and also i actually also watched it on al jazeera where they've made this kind of pr prediction that nigeria could become a real key player in world economies you know within the next 100 years yeah now, 100 years, God give us life. Maybe we'll still be here, but <laughs> I, don't, I, I, don't say, I don't want to be here at the age of 100, <laughs> you know? I don't want to be here by the age of 100. At least God give me at least good 90, 95. Yeah, know, yeah, like, yeah. Enough. 
Very you know, good. Except, you know, except otherwise. But ideally, you know, what I'm trying to say here, 100 years from now, there's really nothing that you and I can actually do rather than just sitting down waiting to die. <laughs> All right? But our children's children will see that. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. So the point I'm trying to make is I think the infrastructure needs to be developed more. Um, Lagos at the moment is booming. Real estate in Lagos is booming. Real estate in Abuja is booming. Real estate in Portacourt and all these other cities is booming. Yeah. But the fact is that is the real estate really booming the way we wanted it to really boom? Are we building affordable homes, really? Where the luxury market is doing well, but again, yeah. a lot of politicians are hiding their money through, you know, luxury real estate in Africa. Mm. Right, and building a lot of luxury. But the fact is that is there affordable homes being built? Is there affordable cities being recreated? I think one of the greatest things Nigeria needs to do to look at is real estate market is by going to building communities, going to building cities. Right. If you there's two cities, not cities, they're actually states that have a lot of X roads. We need to deal with all that problems. If we deal with all these different challenges, Africa's, we've got the numbers. Nigeria alone is close to almost 300 million. If we really take proper stock, we are up to 300 million, obviously. The well, statistics. I, I don't know about that. I know we're we're over, I know we're over 200 million, million people. Yeah. You know, imagine the Nigerians that has been born, like my children are being born here. They're Nigerians. Mm. Are they be counted? Your children probably well, that well, well, but, but, but they, they don't live there. They, they don't live. Yeah, there. but they don't live there. But it's still the the the, the, the blood, mm. right? I, I meet a lot of Nigerians. They say, "Oh, my parents are from Nigeria. I'm 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 English. Right? <laughs> my parents are American. <laughs> they are all Africans." If you pull all these numbers together, you know. So my point is, yes, Nigeria has a great fight. You know, very vital opportunities around its real estate. Yeah. But I think infrastructurally. We need to work on our monetary policies. We need to work on our, 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 our you know, road infrastructure. And we need to yeah. create that enabling environment so that we can begin to attract more of international investment or international business people like us. Listen, economics are not built by the government. It's built by no. business people and yeah. entrepreneurs. Yeah. And I think Nigerians need to create that enabling environment that will allow us to do what we need to do so that we can thrive and create a better economy. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, in fact, I, I once had a friend of mine on the podcast who lives in around the, the lucky axis of Lagos. And one of the things we talked about is that uh, they, they live uh, a luxury life, uh, building fantastic houses in lucky with no gutters. <laughs> I mean, in the last uh, few weeks now, the flood raging across Ni uh, Nigeria without the, 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 the right infrastructure to channel yeah. water, what will happen if something happens? Let's say there's a, an earthquake somewhere in the ocean that the water from the beach, a tsunami happens. What happens? For how long would that water stay inland the, without the right channels to take it back to the sea? You know, so we, we have a lot of things to, to, to do. Uh, uh, like you said, we need uh, the right enabling environment to allow the entrepreneurs like you to get there and start uh, doing things you know absolutely i agree yeah. yeah so see this this is this is one one of one question i want to ask you as a business as a property investor you see in nigeria you were born in benin i was born somewhere in in delta state my home my close to my hometown it's a local that's where I, born, I was born now i know one thing we do in africa in nigeria in particular people who live in the cities and have a little money yeah they go back home to build mansions you know 
and the house they built, the mansions, they never live there. They maybe, they go there maybe twice a year and spend maximum 30 days a year in that mansion, you know? For me, it's a waste of uh, resources, you know? So for you as a business person, so give my, my audience uh, a, a, a case, a business case, why they should not go to the village and build that kind of massive properties in the village where no one lives and uses the, the property. So give us that, that case. Why? Great, great question. Thank you so much, Akene, for that. I'm going to come with three, from three angles on this. Okay. And I'm going to start internationally, and I'm going to go to the state level, and I'm obviously going to end at the village level. Okay. I'll give a very simple example. I'm born Nigerian. When I first, the very first couple of years I live in this country, the mentality that I had was this here, Britain, this mm. country I live here, you know, from my mother, from my brothers, was here is not home, mm. right? So here is not home. You're not going to live here. You're going to come back home to live. That was okay. home, number one. Number two was even, I remember, my, like I said, my father married seven wives. Mm. My wife is not Nigerian, right? Okay. You know, but the truth is, I'm being, I'm Benin boy. I'm a Benin man. Yes. Benin boy. My mother, will, yes. my, my parent will say to me, oh, your wife you married is not Nigerian. Not Nigerian in a different country. So whatever you have in that country, it's not yours. <laughs> it's what you have at home. That's at home. So we've, it's, it, it, we've been given the wrong orientation right from the moment we're born. Mm. all through to the way we become adults and we've adapted that same mentality and we a lot of people have not broken away from it okay to become independent to creating a path for themselves and it's quite important that we need to discover our purpose who are you what is are you living your life based on what your parents told you was correct and you just you know went through that process or you actually never questioned i'll give an example again i i personally here in england i don't own a house in nigeria Okay. I don't. I don't even own land in Nigeria. But I used to. Mm. I, I used to. I once upon a time owned a land in Nigeria. I once upon a time owned properties. But when I started talking to mentors, you asked me the question, where what what people what at what, what time? What what where where did I actually you know reorientate myself and yeah. begin my trajectory? Now in this particular case, I'm trying to say now, when I started using mentors, the land I had, I sold. Yeah. The house I bought, I sold. Mm -hmm. and the you, money you I had, I brought the money. back here. All right. Whether the exchange rates were laid up or not, but I, whether it was 10,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds, I brought it back. At that time, exchange rate was less than 400 naira to a pound. Mm. Today, the pound is handy for a thousand. Yeah. So if I had done it today, I would have lost even all of the money. Yeah, <laughs> but I did it quite quicker. Now, when we come into a foreign country, there's this there's this thing of you can't settle in that country, especially those you know. In, I can understand why those who stay in a non English speaking country do it, but if you stay in a non speaking English country, you want to get into your get yourself into a speaking English country as soon as possible, so it feels mm. like home. So I could speak from the perspective that I, we both live in an English speaking country where yeah. we don't have to relearn some certain patterns or languages. So I sold those houses, brought them back, sold those houses, brought the money back here. Now, in 2017, when I started building my property business, I instantly discovered that I was learning some great skills. 2018, I told my wife, we will start acquiring our asset in 2019. Before 2017, we owned our, we bought our house that we lived in. We, that was where we got married in 2006. We lived there. The property had appreciated to almost 430,000 pounds. By 2019, myself and my wife, we moved out of a owned house in England into a rented property. Okay. We refinanced that property, all right, after adding value to it. And that yeah. property put 300,000 pounds in my bank account. Yeah. Today, from three from a 400,000 pounds property empire to a property portfolio of over 7 million. 
and yet I don't own a house that I live in. Yeah. Neither do I own a house or land in a dull state where I'm originally from. So now let me now relate it to your question. Why, how, I think I can be rude about this. <laughs> uh, yes, permit me to. And the reason why I want you to permit me to, because I want to give Go a ahead, message. brother. I want the message to be strong. How foolish would it be that we have been taught to own where we live first before building wealth? Liability against assets. Liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. Yep. Asset is something that puts money, money your in pocket. your pocket. Yep. Good debt against bad debt. How come we've been told to lavish so much millions in doing a wedding ceremony, borrow so much money, so much debt to do a wedding ceremony, and you don't have an asset that puts money back in your pocket? Yep. Yes, it's good to celebrate parties and birthdays. Somebody who is broke should not celebrate his birthday. <laughs> right? And now, let's relate it back. Why would you go and you see somebody work so hard in the UK? Because they have the wrong message, because they have the wrong learning. They've taken 20,000 pounds of the investment they have here in the UK, and they've gone to buy land in the village, build a nice bungalow. They lock it up. Nobody lives in there. Nobody gives them money. And even if that property gives them money once in a while, the property gives them less than 100 pounds a month. And you've taken 20, you've taken 50, 70, 100,000 pounds to build a house in, you know, in a place where you're getting 100 pounds a month. I'll give an example. Once upon a time, I have a cousin who built, he, to, he lived in Japan. He built a massive estate in, 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 in Edo State. Now, the estate, he's, he, he, when, we, when I sat down with him and I did a strategy session with him, he spent over five hundred thousand dollars. His entire life work for over thirty years in Nigeria he built a massive estate. The estate he's built is over um, seventeen flats or seventeen blocks of flat in somewhere in a Doe state, and he makes round about less than four million naira a month a, a year. Sorry, less than four about four million because each of the flat rents for about two hundred thousand naira a year. In the end, he makes less than four million naira or so, less than three million naira at the end of the year. So he collects rent for four million naira. But he invested half a million pounds. Yeah. If you yeah. invested half a million pounds in real estate in the UK, not only will you have access to liquidity, you have access to leverage, you have access to rently reoccurring passive income, and then you have access to capital appreciation. Leverage meaning that you can refinance, you can repurpose, you can re recycle that money. In Nigeria, the bank doesn't loan you money, except you know someone that is a bank manager and you have to pay them. <laughs> so you can see how we've been, mis we've been there's a lot of mispriorities and misengagement and misknowledge appropriation from us living abroad and taking the money back home to build properties in some certain place. But that is different for the guy who buys a house in Banana Island. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that's different from the guy who bought a property on Bodilon. That's different from the guy who buys a property on Maitama. Yeah, or Surulere. Or, or Surulere. Yeah. But, but again, if you wanted to create real wealth, I think it's quite important. First of all, why would you go and go to all the way to Iseluku, the village? You build the massive house that you sleep in twice a year. You've tied down. Let's just, and most of them spend millions in building these houses. Hundreds millions, million, yeah. 200 million to build this marble, gold plate, gold plate, and all these have house some of them will even have house boys house get in there and yeah. they're every month so you see some say oh i'm broke this month you know i need to pay my house get my driver my this my that it's just mispriorities yeah so i'll give you an example for myself i just said to you just now i don't own the house that i currently live in the uk but i have a rent roll that is quite decent month in month out across my entire organization we do quite decently on a yearly basis all right and every single month, I don't have to ever work a day in my life because I made a strong decision in 2019 to move out of the house that I own. And one of yeah. my properties pays me at least 3,000 pounds net a month. That's just one property. Mm, mm, mm. So I don't ever have to work. My wife doesn't ever have to work. And I just keep spinning that wheel. Spinning it. I can spin that wheel to where we're generating 100,000 pounds a month. I can spin that wheel to where we're generating 50,000 pounds a month. I can spin that same wheel until we're generating 220,000. 
all these different figures. But I could have been so stupid and so foolish if I took that money and quickly went to Iseluku to build a, build a mansion. Yeah. A mansion that I'm never going to live in. So I think is we've been told the wrong things and we've adapted that wrong way of living. You know, we've adapted so many things that are wrong, but are indirectly correct. I think we, the word wealth creation as well, it's not something that a lot of people have become quite comfortable with. So, yeah, if, you, if you're making such decision right now and say, okay, you're, you live here, you want to take your money back home to go and build a mansion, it's because you don't know where you live in the society you need. England, the Bank of England has just increased the interest rate to 3%. Yeah. Okay. Lending rate probably is going to go to about 7%. In Nigeria, the central bank of Nigeria's interest rate is over 25%. Yep. And the cost of borrowing in Nigeria is very expensive. You pay confession costs, you pay all these different fees. And plus, you have to, generically, you have to know somebody in the bank for you to get a loan. So in the UK, you only need to talk to the computer of your credit score and you get a loan in your bank. So why would you, why would you build in an economy, all right, that it's very volatile or rather be in an economy that's stable? People talk about the current recession at the moment. I laugh because I know where I'm coming from. In where I'm coming from, the cost of money is expensive. In England, regardless of the interest, the cost of money is still very cheap. But yeah. you just have to understand. Really to be, to yes. Do. Yeah. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's just that our people don't educate themselves enough. And that's why you see us running, taking all the money, all the hard work that we, you know, all of the hard money that we make here and we take it back to Nigeria. Now, what am I doing here? I'm actually living my life like I live in Nigeria, like I would have lived in Nigeria. Yeah. So I'm building a, such a solid base where if I needed a driver here, you know, God willing soon, you know, I would be able to afford a driver. If I needed a house at the moment, we already have, you know, somebody who comes in to help us clean the house, iron the clothes, look after the house and stuff like that. So the economy is working for me here. So I don't need to move all that money back home. Hmm. Hmm. Well, Thank you for that. You know, we we actually need uh, to re-educate ourselves, okay? Because uh, both here uh, in our cities, back in Africa, because uh, we are doing so many things wrong and uh, misappropriating the little money we have. We don't use it to create wealth. Uh, that's why many of us, uh, we work for 30 years and yet don't have anything to show for it. Yeah. You know? a, lot, yeah. a lot of Nigerians here in this country are actually multi-millionaires, but they, they haven't discovered it. Yeah. A lot of Nigerians, they work hard in this country. A lot of foreigners, they work so hard, but they didn't discover it because you know why? They make, you know, they make, 5,000 pounds a month, 3,000 pounds a month. Some are nurses, some are doctors. They're making a lot of money. But because they're shipping that money back home to mm. build that unfinished project, all right? That, here, that, would, that wouldn't, wouldn't make any money back. Yeah. Yes, they're shipping all that money back, right? They're shipping all that money back, buying the land, building the house from the scratch by themselves. Whereas if you had a 70,000 pound savings in your account, I need to buy a house of 200,000 pounds right now. You only needed 25% of that money to buy the asset. Yeah. And that asset, the bank is going to give you the rest of it. You're going to pay the bank some little chunks of it. You're going to keep some for yourself and you can spin that way over and over and over again. Yep. Yep. One of the reasons why it's so easy for me to teach people how to become multimillionaires in property. So over the last three years alone, I showed people my processes and I've created just during the lockdown and now I've created three property millionaires because I showed them some simple methodologies and process and blueprints of how to literally, re re, you know, just re-irritate yourself, go from here to there and you can, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. So you have shown people how to do it. Okay. I, I, I would think that their habits and uh, characteristic characteristics of people who are successful uh, property entrepreneurs. Okay. Yes. So please share some of those habits with my audience. Thank you so much for that. So the thing is, uh, you've heard me throughout this entire interview. 
you can hear me say mentors, 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 mentors over and over. Yep. Until I started, until I started using mentors, my life did not change. Until I changed my circle, my life did not change. So I've lived in this country now going through over 18 years. And for me to get those habits, number one thing, I had to change my circle. Yeah. All right. My circle before 2016 or rather 2015. So I came to this country in 2004. Between those times, the only people that I knew around me were just people who, you know, the, the richest person I knew was one auntie, Auntie Stella, who had a corner shop in Peckham. She sells tomatoes, onions, she sells food stuff and everything, all this African food stuff. That was the most successful person I knew. Guess one day I sat down with her recently and we spoke and she said, oh, you know, what? I still went there. She still has the same shop and she still had just one of them. And we're talking and she's like, ask business. She's like, yeah, yeah, how much are you doing a month? She's like, yeah, we're doing you know, on a good month, we make three thousand pound profit. On a bad month, you know, we make you know one thousand, or sometimes we make about five thousand. Depend anyway. And I've known this woman throughout my entire journey in this country. That was the only woman I ever knew that was successful around me. Now, the most educated and the most successful professional I knew was a doctor, but he shipped all his money back home all the time. Mm. Right. So my circle was just beneath people. Igbo people, Yoruba people, all of us people together. Mm. And the only thing we enjoyed was just those similar things that we enjoyed in Nigeria, not actually creating wealth and actually building. So like I said, we make money, we think we need to enjoy immediately. Yeah. So that instant gratification, yeah. you know, we make so much money, you know, we go to weddings, you see somebody change 500 pounds to spray in a wedding, you know, you, 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 you see someone doing a child, a child's name is ceremony. A child just turned one year old. You are a security guard in a security job in, 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 in Tesco. Your wife probably is a doctor or maybe both of you are doctors. You know, it's good to celebrate. But you go to an African party, you see them lavishing over 30, 40,000 pounds to celebrate. Right? It's great if you can afford it. And yeah. it's, it's great. But how about those who are not at that level, who spend same 20,000 pounds and your security guard? Yeah. How about those who spoil all these different types of money? You see somebody celebrating 50 years old, all right? And she works in a care home where she's getting, she's, maybe she's getting paid 10 pounds an hour. She's celebrating 50 years old. And then you didn't see her borrowing money to celebrate her 50 years old party. I see them every day because people message me every day, oh, I'm celebrating my 50th. You know, I'm celebrating my 50th and I, you know, maybe she's in care work or she's doing some sort of other kind of not high quality job or some credit job. And she's like, oh, that, that job, I'm, you know, my 50th, I'm, ah, I mean, I've spent 30,000 though, you know, I should be. <laughs> and there was, I was actually moved recently. I said, auntie, just look at yourself. You said you have, you've saved over how many years you're going to blow 30,000 pounds on your, on your 50th birthday. I said, so people are going to come and eat and drink your 30,000 pounds. Then after that, what's going to happen? I said, you've actually created, you, you've built, 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 built. And all of a sudden, you decided to just what? Bring Break it. Out, <laughs> All right. And you see an average African person every now and then wearing the designer's clothes was meant for people who were making higher income. Yeah. So people who are celebrity, like a footballer who can play good football. So what am I trying to say here? The habits is not, you know, the main problem. The biggest problem is again, how we've been reorientated. So number one habit is we have to reorientate ourselves, especially those of us who are still on these different types of come-ups. We, we need to start focusing on building. So, you need to sit down and write yourself a goal of the next 20 years. What do I want my life to be like in the next 20 years? Yeah. Am I prepared to do what's hard now so that my life is easy? So yeah. instead of celebrating every single birthday of your kids, celebrating your every, you know, every year you spend 20, 15,000 pounds celebrating birthdays, you know, inviting people, spending 15, 20,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds, one, two, three, 4,000 pounds, always doing parties and all spending, spoiling all this money, wearing so much expensive things. You want to start investing in things that build life, things that you can pass as a legacy, things you need to become an empire builder. Stop wasting, stop living a life of wastefulness. 
And that's that's what we do as a people in Nigeria. In yeah. Africa. It's a normal thing. It's a normal yeah. it's, and, it's a normal, it's like just a normal thing. Yeah. And that's 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 substantial in in how our countries in Africa are. We don't build. No. We consume. You know. Why do you think an oil producing nation like Nigeria, top 50 in OPEC, we still import petroleum products? Yeah. It's only recently we started to consume our own. Before now, we never consume our own music. Before now, we yeah. never really consume our own movies the way we're consuming it now. Now. Before yeah. now, we never actually, if you were native before now, I'm from the I'm from the 80s. I was born in the 80s. I'm 42 years old now. So I know what I'm talking about. I'm not, I'm young, but I'm not still that young because I saw a lot of them. Before now, if you were native, it's now that Afrobeat and Nollywood has helped promote, promote, Those, promote African yeah. clothes. Yeah. Before now, if you were native to a party, people be like, oh, you know, what's that? What, what yeah. people forgot is mm -hmm. the Gucci you're wearing somebody's name. Yeah. Yeah. The Versace you're wearing is somebody's name. You know? Yes, I'm wearing people's clothes, but... This shirt I'm wearing is less than 20, 30, 40 pounds. Bill yep. Gates, where's this, <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg wears the same plain colors every now and every day. day. Yeah. So I think we need to start resetting our priorities. It's very essential. Very good. Very good. Very good. Yes, uh, Daniel. So you have uh, actually answered one of my biggest questions which I was going to ask you uh, what you just told my audience, uh, the kind of uh, advice that young people need to hear, okay, to start building rather than consuming, okay? And uh, you, you said it just like a, a, real, a, 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 a real entrepreneur to teach people, tell people to build 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 and this is what we need this kind of habit of building is what we need to actually build africa because i go online i talk to young people and uh, they mostly complain okay complain 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 and then when we ask them okay you're complaining about this what are you going to do? Most of them have no idea. Or they are good at complaining. We tell them, okay, you do this. Let's see how it works. They are not willing to do it. But they are always ready to complain. You know, so what you just told my audience is what we need to do. All of us are yeah. still young, okay? Yeah. We're still, I'm still, I'm, I'm just a little bit below uh, 50. So all of us are, are youths, okay? <laughs> so now uh, I want you to, to, do, to tell my audience uh, what's your vision for Africa in the next 20, 30 years. Okay. What, how do you see Africa in the next yep. 20, 30 years? I think it's, you know, the Bible, one of the greatest book ever written said, when the foundation is faulty, what can the righteous do? Mm. The biggest mm. problem that's faced, that's faced Africa is that our foundation, you know, is faulty. Okay. I think if I'm being very brutally honest, we got our freedom too prematurely. And that's why, and that's why we've gone back to enslave ourselves. You oh know, we, we talked about the colonial master, the slavery, but now where we live in now, we're actually enslaved ourselves. How many times has a British prime minister flown to Nigeria to seek for medication? Mm. How many times is the America, the president of the United States of America, gone to Nigeria for advice? How many times, okay, all right, has the UK 
had to import even the most one of you know one of the you know we we have rice all right we have rice you know you know you know in the northern part of nigeria how many of those rice has the UK signed a bilateral agreement for us to now become one of the largest rice supplier to the UK mm. or even to Europe? So the foundation has been built quite soft. You even now have Nigerians who say, oh, no, I don't eat Nigerian rice. I want to eat foreign rice. <laughs> right? So the vision for me in Africa, I want to see in Nigeria that, that I want to see in Nigeria that we have great minds because the thing about Nigeria and especially Africa is Africa, we have great minds. Africa are becoming one of the best brains, but yet we're suffering. Africa has the brightest stars, but yet how come we're not leading from the front and still leading behind? Right? One of traffic lights today was invented by a Nigerian, a black man. Drones was invented by a black man, an, an American. Really? Gatwick Airport is owned by a Nigerian. Okay, yeah, I, I know that, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, how come? Just, just, look, just look, you go to the Nigerian airport, it's like, I can't, I can't even... In, you know, it, it, I, when I get into... You see, I always try to just keep my cool when it comes to that because it just pains me. You know? How many times have you seen a Gordon Brown, a Boris Johnson... A, um, a, you know, um, 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 what was the name of the last prime minister before John? Uh, Theresa May, holiday in Nigeria. But you see a Buhari, you know, an Obasanjo, or the previous president holiday in the UK. Right? So I think, if I'm being honest, we're lost. And let me give you a very simple example in this vision of Nigeria. If you take the UK now as a nation and you import everyone straight to Nigeria and then import all Nigerians back to the UK 20 years from now, all Nigerians will be migrating back to, to the to, to, <laughs> um, Yeah, will be migrating back because they would have fixed Nigeria. Will you see all of us migrating back? But the thing is, we don't fix. We don't, we, 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 we we're in this... I think the vision for Nigeria should be, or Africa, is, I'm using Nigeria because I'm quite passionate about my country. We need to create Africa that works. So look, the EU works. The European Union works. African Union. How often do you hear about African Union? There's yeah. AU. There's AU. Yeah. We were, when COVID struck, we were depending on Europe to bring us cure for COVID. Yeah. But the EU, all right, they were busy. So I think EU, you know, AU, EU needs to see what, a, you know, AU, sorry, needs to see what EU is doing. African Union yeah. needs to see what European is doing. They need to even, even policing their borders, right? So I think Africa needs to wake up. Africa needs to really wake up. There should be a mindset of this embezzlement that has been created that needs to be completely, you know, you know, deleted. I think Africa needs a total reorientation. Mm. We need to go back to the basic and build the foundation is 40 when the foundation is 40 the only thing the righteous do is to destroy and to rebuild africa needs to be rebuilt wow wow uh wow see me see see me see wow wow <laughs> be because you just said something that uh many young Africans will be very angry about. Okay. They will be so angry at you for saying that. Mm. Yes. Because uh, I've tried to say a little bit of what you said and the backlash from them has been massive. Okay. Uh, yes, our foundation is faulty. Very faulty. Uh, and we need to rebuild it. Yep. And uh, until we 
acknowledge how faulty it is yep and we agree to rebuild it yep we are not going anywhere okay and that's 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 exactly why i have this podcast for us to start talking about these things uh wow daniel it, I, it's i, it's, I, I it, thank it, you it, it, it's 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 deep it is deep yes you know it is really it is really deep because there's work to be done you know i um in order for me to become the person I am today, I went through challenges, I went through processes, I went through different things, and I was going to quit. I was going to, you know, I was going to, you know, I felt like, you know, well, it's not possible, you know, and being honest, I had to rewire my brain, I had to change my circle, I had to listen to people who have done it. The fact is, when it comes to Africa, we all come here all the time, we come here, we come here, we spend money, we come here, we spend money, we go to Ireland, we spend money. If we build the first structure, Harrods will build in, in, in Lagos. Yeah, definitely. If we build the right first structure, Sainsbury's will expand into Nigeria. Until we really seriously create, create an enabling of what, what all this Western community, with the Western world, they've overdeveloped already. Yeah. So there's two cities. The Western communities are overdeveloped already, though there's still cities that still need development and there's still no room for yeah. development. But guess what they do? Why do you keep seeing the change? I'll give an example. I live in Bromley. Lusham is not too far away from me. Mm. Over the last, there's been a regeneration of plan going up in Lusham. The average sale property price in Lusham alone now is about 500,000 pounds. Say mm. eight, eight years ago, 10 years ago, the average sale price in Lusham was about 250. Wow. So, so what it has they doubled. Do, so what do they do to bring those, 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 those new, 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 uh, new investments? All right. They go back to the basic, they destroy They, all the factories and everything is no longer working. They rebuild. They created an enabling environment that then allow investors, creative people, great minds to mastermind. And then from the mastermind comes creativity. From creativity comes what? The plan. Yeah. So until Africa come together to unite, mastermind, you know, you know allow themselves to be great because we have great minds. But the point is that everybody's right. In Africa, everybody's right. Who wants to, who, sh who shall lead us? Who? Nobody. Wow. Daniel, uh, at this point, I would say thank you very much uh, for being a good guest, a great guest of thank Think you. Big for Africa podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been amazing having me here. It's been amazing. I had a great conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Just All by right. the way, for any one of you who are listening to this podcast and you want to get into your wealth creation and you want to build a legacy and you know for yourself and your family uh, make sure you go and follow me on social media on linkedin uh dr daniel moses and if on uh, facebook dr daniel moses instagram dr daniel moses and if you want to know more about what i do do visit my website which is www.propertywe.co.uk and All there right. you will find out about my mentorship program and every other thing else Thank yeah. you so much. See, Daniel, I would collect all this information. I will add them to the, the uh, conversation, conversation notes, okay? Right. Fantastic. Thank, thank, thank you so you. much for having me. God bless. Bye. Bye.